Hello, this is Nihongo Gamer, and you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. Welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, coming at you with another amazing episode. And today we have a very special guest. I'm really honored to have him on. And he goes by Nihongo Gamer. He's a YouTuber, content creator, he's a gamer, streamer, FTC player, and much, much more. And it's just an honor to have him on the show. We're going to talk about a variety of things from the FTC, gaming, content creation, as well as coffee, because coffee is a big aspect of his channel. And uh, I love me a cup of coffee every now and then. So, with that being said, if you guys are ready to do it, I'm ready to do it. Let's go ahead and welcome Nihongo Gamer onto the show. Welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, and I have with me the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Nihongo Gamer. Man, introduce yourself and thank you for coming on the show. Hello, Mikhail. I'm Nihongo Gamer, and uh, I don't actually know if I am the, the one and only. Who knows? Maybe there's another one. I'm, I've always been convinced that maybe if I, if I were to see the other Nihongo Gamer and I ran at him at full <laughs> speed, maybe we would stick together and become one forever I'm looking for my my light half no you need I, to do I get the to be fusion the dog. dance <laughs> yeah we'll do the fusion dance. i actually yeah i've actually only recently seen that episode of dragon ball where they do that like i knew the memes you know like there's just so many memes on the internet now and basically i stopped basically i people you know i'm sorry but i i just couldn't be bothered after freezer i was like look you made me watch about 18 episodes where he said it's the last episode, and then it wasn't the last episode. So I was like, I'm never watching this show again. And then it turns out I missed the whole fusion dance, Cell, Majin Buu, all of that. <laughs> so I've been watching it again recently, and it's like hundreds and hundreds of filler. It's not even a show, it's just filler. <laughs> How did they get away with this back then? Oh my God. So yeah. So are you watching it with, um, are you watching the Dragon Ball Kai with all the filler cut out, or are you watching the regular. i have a question about that is dragon ball kai is that is that cropped is it actually the the is it just the show with the top and the bottom cut off so that it looks like it's widescreen pretty much or did they or did they draw extra bits on the side so that it was a widescreen because I, I the first time i saw it i was like it seems zoomed in they can't have just they can't have drawn extra information they probably just cropped it so it looks yeah. widescreen now yeah i was like I'm not watching this. <laughs> yeah. Well, did they did they cut out filler episodes in all of in it? Five? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, personally, I didn't really. I wasn't really like trying to catch up with Dragon Ball. I just wanted to get through what I missed. Like, it, it, I was like, I never actually got around to watching all this ridiculousness. I want to experience it as it was, and now I regret it. I wish. I hadn't <laughs> Well, if you if you want Kai, I have the whole thing. I can send send it to you. Anyway. That's all right. That's all right. I've 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 almost got to the end of Boo. I actually cheated by looking at the episode list now, and I can see there's only like a hundred million episodes left. So I know how long it's going to take. But Dude. actually, I have another. I have a bone to pick with Netflix. I was watching it on Netflix, and I was like, yeah, only ten more episodes left, and then it just disappeared. And now it's on Prime. It fortunately. Fortunately, I'm massively privileged and I have Prime, but if I didn't, <laughs> what, what? Can you imagine making someone watch 275 episodes of filler, basically, and then the last 10 having to move over to another platform to watch it? It's like, the you own nothing these days. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, we pretty much owned nothing before. It's just, it's more clear to us now <laughs> how little we own. Very true. And wait till you get to, uh, if you do get to watching Dragon Ball Super, Oh my god, so much. The, you thought the filler was bad in Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> oh wow, does no. it get worse? No it, way. It, it gets way worse. It's that way worse amazing. than Super. I'm almost I, I'm I'm not even I'm not even mad. I'm I'm impressed. 
dude, I'm <laughs> skipping whole arcs. And I was watching it in Japanese. I was like, okay, um, yeah, this is about 15 episodes of filler. No, I'm good. I'm going to just skip yeah. all the way over. Yeah, life is just too short for Dragon Ball. No, but I love, listen, I, the reason I keep watching it is because I, I love the characters. I love Vegeta. It's the same thing with with fighting games it's just it's like i'm not just playing it because the new fighting game came out it's like people fell in love with characters you know it's like they loved ryu they loved chun li they loved wolverine they loved these characters but then when someone stands up and goes the characters don't even matter it's like we sat through this filler because the characters matter that's the only reason we're still here <laughs> <laughs> oh well <laughs> oh not man. to mention any name <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so what's what's the first what's the first topic? Oh, you gotta introduce yourself, man. Tell people. Oh, where my you can find oh, I haven't introduced myself. I am <laughs> Nihongo Gamer. I run a YouTube channel and a Twitch channel when I have time for it. But it's mostly it's mostly the YouTube channel, and I basically play video games from Japan. That was pretty much the original idea. The very, very original idea was to find games that had enough text and voice overlay that mm. I could, well, overdub, that I could use it to learn more about the Japanese language. And then after a while, I was like, I'm too lazy for this. I'm just going to play games. <laughs> <laughs> the Hongo Gamer, the channel about learning the language, has turned into a fighting game channel, which involves like no language whatsoever, apart from Tatsumaki Senpukyaku. It's like, <laughs> What word is that? <laughs> Japanese people, Japanese people, are like, what? Are you talking about tornadoes? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. But no, it's a move from Street Fighter. Your people invented it. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Nobody plays that game here. <laughs> that's not true. I'm just, I'm just joking. They play, it. they do play, it. they do play. It. <laughs> oh man, like so that's, in, my, um, that's my introduction. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, um, how how long have you been? You know, for the audience that's not aware, like, how long have you been at? Uh, both Twitch and YouTube. I think my Twitch channel might even predate the YouTube channel. Someone discovered this recently because they could find out what date you started your account. They said really? 2014. Oh, no, no, no. But the YouTube channel started in 2013. And what year is it now? It's 2019. 19. Yeah, yeah. I can't do math, but it's some number between <laughs> 13 and 19. <laughs> it's something like five or six years. And oh, wow. It's totally blown into something that I had no idea it was going to be. In, in fact, the, the idea wasn't originally to be a, a channel where I actually do most of, mostly anything. The point, mm -hmm. the point was I was going to get all of my friends who know about Japanese to review various Japanese games and talk about which ones were best for studying the language. I was just going to own the channel. I wasn't going to like be the main character. And then everyone disappeared, and it turns out nobody has the time to write reviews because writing takes time. But with when you're recording a video, you can just say any old nonsense that you want, and then edit out the crap later. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. No, no, I just no. Realized, you realize I need a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the the God's honest truth about the channel was that writing stuff. I discovered that people weren't reading as much as they were before on the internet. It was all about web pages. But after YouTube, after YouTube introduced monetization, mm -hmm. people became a little bit too lazy to read stuff, myself included. So it's like, well, even I don't want to read this stuff. <laughs> why, why bother <laughs> writing it? So yeah, made the channel, and it's kind of it's, it's more fun as well. I think when you when you're slaving away at the text-based articles, sometimes you're like, what if nobody reads this? That's Oops. exactly what I'm going through right now. Like I, I'll do a video and do a written review, and then I'm like, "Who's gonna? Who's going to my website to read this anyway?" It's really, it's really difficult, and it, and it could have nothing to do with the content or the quality of the content that you're writing. It could just be the culture is people don't have time for reading anymore, and maybe that is the future. Maybe everything will become visual, oral media. Yeah, but. I, I don't know, even even myself, I was like, look, even if this is a great article, it's difficult to get someone to, uh, to sit down and read it for you. But a video, even if it's terrible, it it costs you no extra effort to put it on in the background. And yeah. so people will put your videos on in the background, and if it happens to become interesting, they may look over at the screen and go, oh, wait, what is this that came on on the autoplay? Maybe I'll actually watch this and actually subscribe. So 
there is that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, um, you, you're very, very successful on YouTube. Like, you've got over 200,000 subscribers at this point. I'm like, really happy with how it's turned out. Yeah, I think so. But I wouldn't I, know. I don't know if I would call it success, though, because I think everyone who's at a similar level, it's like fighting games. I think anytime you look up at someone's rank above you, you go, wow, how did you get so good at fighting games? And everyone at goals is like, you have no idea how bad I am at this game compared to the diamonds and the platinums and the grandmasters and the masters and the warlords out there. So we're always, <laughs> we're always looking up. And anyone else who looks at your rank and goes, oh, hey, it's quite successful. You're like, is it? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I'm really not handling this very well, but I'm glad you think it's successful. You know what I mean? You know, and, it, and it, I think it's also because, like, a lot of YouTubers I know, both big and small, like, their thing is constantly, like, oh, how do I get people to keep watching? How do I get them to subscribe? Do I do, you know, it's a whole thumbnail. Like, there there can be a grind on YouTube, and I've seen a lot of people who aspire to be, like, a bigger channel, like, you know, mm. a channel like as, such as yourself or, like, Spawn Wave or any of the bigger channels, and it's, like, there's a point where if they don't see like the immediate results, they'll burn out. And I tell people as well, like it takes time. Like sometimes you can just have that niche that just, you know, it blows up. But other times it's kind of like, Hey, you know, you just whack away at it over time. Like I just hit 10,000 subscribers a month ago and I've been at it for two years. I'm like, finally, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. It. I mean, it's it's a Simon it's a Simon Sinek thing, and he goes into a lot of detail about it as well when he's he's talking about millennials, and it's maybe no fault of their own. It, I mean, it can't be their own fault because it, it's happening to every single millennial, so it must just be the culture. But it's it's um, because of how much we're forced to, how, because of how much we're encouraged to look at the analytics and the numbers of likes and the number of retweets and the number of views and the number of subscriptions. We're so into measuring ourselves that before someone can tell us you suck and you failed, we've already told ourselves, I suck and I fail. <laughs> so that we don't even get to that. We don't even get to the point when the trolls can insult us because we're already beating ourselves down with our yeah. own fists. So, but then on the other side, it's also, it's also the case that sometimes you can just put your head down and do the grind and get nowhere. So it's not a guaranteed thing. I think people used to talk about it very romantically. Oh, you just put your head down, you do the work and you'll get there. It's like, yeah, well, capitalism used to work like that, but now you can work really, really hard, harder than people who are rich and still never make anywhere near as much money. And yeah. that's just that's just the reality. So yeah, it's, yeah it goes both ways, I guess. And, and do you think there's like a because I've seen videos where people are like, oh, these are the strategies you can use to be successful. And I'm over here like, I think it's per per like mm. per person. Like, I don't know. Like, mm. I, I got to a point where I stopped counting numbers. I want to say five, six months ago. And I'm just like, screw it. I'm going to do a video. I'm going to have fun. And I just I, even now, like, I don't even look at it until the things like, congratulations, you hit this. I'm like, oh, awesome. Yay. <laughs> mm. Mm. But I don't know. Like, I don't know if there is a strategy you can use. I think there's a couple levels of strategy. There's the strategy that you see the most commonly, which is, 10 things you need to do to become successful at YouTube. Mm -hmm. And what you're most likely to watch in those videos, and not all of them, some of them are actually really good. Some of them will be like, if you follow these 10 things, you will succeed. And it's like, well, actually it's 10 things that you did and you were successful. And maybe in your mind, you've got the, uh, what's it called? Double confirmation, confirmation bias. So yeah. now you, yeah, so now you believe that it did lead and there was causality leading to the success. But it doesn't, how do I explain it? It's not always going to work. Then there's like a second category. 10 things that everyone really should be doing at the very least. And it's not written out like that because that's not the exciting title. That doesn't have the word success in it. Mm. But there are definitely a base set of things that people need to clear before they can even start thinking about doing the 10 things that might get them real success. But there are a lot of things that people just get wrong completely from the start, like <clears throat> visual quality or audible 
like audio quality, just the fact that it's completely unedited or the habit of saying um in between every word or sniffling in between every sentence. And even if you do sniffle, it's fine, but you need to like cut it out. And it's not, it's not that you have to do these things. A lot of, and, ah, there's always the get out. Every time I say to someone like, you know, it would really help if you edited all the ums, ahs, and sniffles out of your sentences. They're like, yeah. no, but I watch so-and-so channel and they don't. I'm like, yeah, but they're Michael Jackson already. So it's too, it's, no, they could do anything and they'll still be famous. So yeah. it's like, <laughs> sure, if you were in that position, but are you Michael Jackson? No. So sit down and edit your video. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's so true, though. So there, there's definitely those videos with you know, advice that I think really on a foundation level, you'd be unwise to not do those things. But then, yeah, there are other videos where there's 10 things where like, you could do these things and you still may not succeed. So, you know, and I, I've seen a lot of people that uh, have this idea that you should do sub for sub. And I'm entirely against that. Like, sub I, I can for sub. So every time someone subs to you, you sub to them. Yeah, or the you know the people that hop into your um mm. they'll hop into your ch your uh your video comment section and then they'll be mm. they'll be like oh come subscribe to my channel I sub to your channel sub to mine like no what if <laughs> I don't like your content mm, well that's the thing that's the thing I I I mm, I don't really have an issue with sub for sub and the only reason is that I think on certain platforms that actually probably does work for example mm -hmm. Instagram. I think probably one of the only ways you can get exposure is by following back people. Like when someone sure. follows you, you follow them. And there's this, I think, I think it helps with the whole algorithm. Mm -hmm. I think the, the real issue isn't sub for sub. I feel like the issue is setting an unrealistic rule for yourself. If you set a rule for yourself, like I will sub to anyone who subs to me, then now you're in an issue where what if you morally disagree with the things that a certain person is saying? Now, do you have the right to not sub to them after you set a rule that you would sub to anyone who subs to you? And it's like, okay, well, I'm going to not sub to them because they said something that was outright horrible. I can't yeah. sub to you. And they'll come back and they'll be like, yo, why am I the only one out of 50 people that you didn't sub to? It's like, now I have to explain myself. But I wish I had just <laughs> never set this rule. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah rules rules can be helpful but yeah be careful which ones you set for yourself i suppose <laughs> true true um and so as far as like uh hopping into gaming um how when did you start gaming like what is your earliest gaming memory and what are some of your favorite games to play of all time we talked about this briefly before the podcast began, but oh, I had I the <laughs> cheap version of the Sinclair Spectrum and the BBC Micro, known as the Amstrad. And this thing, I didn't even know how cheap it was. I, I mean, I knew that it was... Look, at the time, I didn't know what BBC Micro and Sinclair Spectrum was, mm -hmm. but the Amstrad, it turns out, it doesn't, it's, does, it does, it's not just a PC running the same games at a lower spec. It's actually got completely different developers making completely different games. So I had the Amstrad version of Tetris. I had the Amstrad version of Gauntlet. The Amstrad, it, they were not like low settings. It was just mm -hmm. some completely different team made it. And I didn't know that until years later. It's like, wait, I had, did not play the same game as you guys, but I thought we were being nostalgic about the same thing. So I'd say, I'd say it started with Amstrad. And then after that, and the only reason we had an Amstrad was because my parents thought it was educational. And, and we mm -hmm. had we had like number crunchers and all those mathematical games and Oregon trails and stuff like that. Mm. But my parents were very opposed to anything with the word game in it, which is of course how you choose your career. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime your parents say, don't do this, you're like, that's my career. <laughs> Come on, how many people have done that anyway? I, I didn't want games to be my career because of that, but my, my parents were very much opposed to it. And my first, Games console was probably, well, we, we borrowed a few consoles from other people, but my parents would not buy a Super Nintendo. And then my aunt came to town. She was like, hey, do you have one of these at home? I was like, no, no, we don't have a Super Nintendo. She's like, oh, I'll buy you one. You know, I'll just buy it right now. I was like, 
mom's not gonna like this <laughs> and my aunt pulled it just, my my mom was not happy but it's too late once it's in the house it's like you got a games console now and that was that was the slippery slope if only she in fact if she had never bought it maybe i would be rich beyond my wildest dreams doing an actual real job but no <laughs> thanks auntie you've uh, you sent me down this path <laughs> i'm so grateful <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> that makes it good. How about, how about you? What was your first? What was your first game device? Um, my first game device was the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Ooh, um, so I had we, we were not that posh. <laughs> my games my... console had cassette tapes. Did you load games from cassette tapes on your Atari? <laughs> <laughs> you press play, and you would load the data off the tape. It's not, I'm not even. It sounds. I know this sounds like a joke. It's not. A, I'm not. It's not even a joke. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I know the, the MSX was like that too, right? Oh, was it? I think so, yeah. That sounds like but, a brand name version of the thing that I had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was the first one I had. What I we, I think we had uh, Pitfall, which I just found it boring back then. And the next thing I know, um, we started playing, my brother started playing Double Dragon for the NES, and I, I got hooked on it. Like, that game... Which is funny because I'm actually working with a guy who's um, creating a new Double Dragon, which, fingers crossed, we're in talks with Arxis Works to make it official. So I actually might have to send that to you. If you like Double it Dragon. It better be called Quadruple Dragon. And if it's not, I will be pissed. <laughs> so this one is called uh, Legend Dragon. of the <laughs> So it's called Legend of the Double Dragon uh, that we're working on, and you can switch styles between Double Dragon 1, 2, 3, and Super on the fly. I'm going to pretend that I had any idea what, what you said. Like I, I, I remember Double Dragon. I remember someone played it, and my only other memory of it, okay, it was on the Master System, which I think is the one before Genesis, right? Yeah. Me yeah before yeah. Mega Drive, whatever it's called. <laughs> And he was just like, yo, we're going to play this game called Double Dragon. And I was like, oh, cool. And he's like, we can play it together. Oh, that's brilliant. All right, we played it together. And then we get to the end boss, and he beats the boss. And he's like, great. Now we have to kill each other. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he, like, beats down on me, and I die. I was like, how? I felt so violate. No, I don't know if the word is violent. Like, backstabbed. I was like, we went through this. As buddies, I thought we were helping each other. We saved the princess, and then you murdered me at the end of the level. So I'm sure everyone had the exact same experience, but it's, what a game. It oh, really spoiler is. alert. Sorry, anyone who hasn't played Double Dragon, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> now you know how it ends. <laughs> no, I, I think you would actually like this one because um, uh, the developer, Magneto, he actually uh, he incorporated... He got to do the game? Yeah, he goes by that. Uh, Mr. Q or Magneto, he goes... He basically incorporated a lot of uh, FTC elements into it. So you've got command inputs, uh, super cancels. Um, and I don't know if this is a spoiler, if I'm supposed to say this, but uh, you know how in Killer Instinct you can do the killer combos? I never, I never owned Killer Instinct. I basically <laughs> couldn't play anything that had blood in it. I'm, I'm the biggest f flower candy. <laughs> I don't know what the word is. I, I was like, whoa, that game has swords with blood. I don't know if we should get that one. Well, think of it as an ultra combo for Street Fighter. That's it, sounds good. it sounds good. It sounds good. Yeah. It sounds so. good for people who like fighting games. I would say that if I were running a business now, I would be very wary about adding fighting game elements to anything, to be quite honest, though. And I was talking, I've been talking to, to people about this recently. But... The thing that people love about fighting games, as if there's one singular thing, <laughs> one of the many things that people like about fighting games, right, is that you go one on one with another human person, and mm. one of you will win and one of you will lose, unless it's a double KO, right? But what also happens is that after you play fighting games, you move into tournaments, right? So mm. a, t a smaller tournament with 100 people, 50 people will fight 50 people, and then 50 people will be losers. Right? Yeah. And then they'll go to losers bracket, whatever. But then of the winners, right? So there are 50 winners, 25 people will fight 25 people, and 25 more people will become losers, right? And then it happens again of those 12 and a half people, you've now got six and a quarter people who will become losers. And at the end of the day, of a hundred people, you've just made you've just made 99 people feel like giant losers. And one person comes out on top with like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. 
I love fighting games personally, but as a business decision, I absolutely would not make one because it's the only game that I know of that makes everyone feel ter terrible apart from one. And that's why then that's why the whole genre ends up so niche and why Battle Royale is the opposite. It's massively successful, right? Because mm. everyone feels like a winner. No one actually lost because we all lost. I, I, I mean, I guess it's the same thing as fighting <laughs> games, but looked at from a different perspective. Do you know what I mean? There's still yeah. only one person who lives to see the end, but no one ever feels the, the, the actual defeat of being the loser. Mm -hmm. But fighting games go through it one by one. It makes everyone feel like I am the loser of this tournament. <laughs> but I mean, of course, I'm, I'm half joking. Of course, it's, it's great. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of fun to it as well. But I don't know if I would make a fighting game. <laughs> I don't know if I would add fighting game elements to anything that I made as well. I think it just scares people. True. And it makes it, it makes it makes fighting game fans really excited. True. True. How, uh, I know, right? Yeah. And um, you know, speaking of uh, tournaments, how many have you entered so far? <laughs> I've been to Tokyo Game Show. I've been to Tokyo Game Show and Evo Japan 2019. It was the only tournaments I've ever been to in my entire life. Oh wow! <laughs> Never. I didn't even know that such a thing existed until Evo 2017. Mm -hmm. About four months before EVO 2017, maybe five months before EVO 2017, I was watching YouTube and there was this, this video that came up. It was called like Capcom versus SNK, Ken versus the world or something. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> and I was watching it and it turned out to be by this guy, Maximilian Dude, right? Who I had never heard of, right? Remember, mm -hmm. this is 2017. I've managed to come all the way. I've managed decades of my life without realizing that fighting game tournaments exist. 2017 and this this max this max guy he's on the he's on screen playing ken and every time he wins or does like a, t a, a tornado kick he goes dicks 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 and i was like what <laughs> what is this what? how is that okay to just keep saying that out that was it was the funniest thing and I, I instantly sent it to everyone i knew i was like did you know people make videos where they play street fights this is hilarious we've gotta we've gotta watch these videos and then you know it's a slippery slope i ended up watching excellent adventures after that. And I was like, oh, now I'm gonna watch <laughs> tournaments on Twitch, I was watching tournaments. And I was like, this Evo thing is about to happen like in a couple months. So I'm gonna watch it. And I watched it on uh, on an iPad. Obviously it happened in America. So I had to watch a replay of it like mm -hmm. the following day. And then after that, I was like, I've got to, I've got to play Street Fighter again. And it was funny cause I'd actually bought Street Fighter on the day that it released and mm -hmm. hated it, Street Fighter V. I was like, wait, Street Fighter doesn't have an arcade mode? I don't want to play online. And I, I, I honestly, I never played an online game until 2017. Can you believe it? I didn't play any on the ball. That's not true. I played Final Fantasy 14. I like, it was a one month free trial. So I played an online, <laughs> online game, but I had never like the idea of going online and playing against other people. That was like, well, I'm not doing that. That sounds terrifying. It, we have the same mentality. That's, that's oh, yeah? kind of how I was for oh, the yes. longest. So what was, what the, yeah. Did you come back to it after a while or something? The only one that really brought me into playing online was, I would say, uh, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike Online Edition. Because mm. I would play Street Fighter 4, but every time I would play Street Fighter 4, I played against people with really bad connection. Mm. And then, for whatever reason, every time I played Street Fighter 3 Third Strike Online Edition, I always got people that had phenomenal connection. So but I they was were like, really good. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, yay, I threw one punch and I got decimated, but it was awesome. <laughs> the net code was great. I lost. I got perfected, but the net code was great. <laughs> I still really want to know, does net code even exist? Is it just this this fantasy concept that we've come up with our, in our minds? Like, we need more things to blame when we lose. Net code. Right. The net code in this game sucks. Like, do I even know what that means? I just, I just need to yell about something. <laughs> but I'm, no, I'm joking. I'm, but you know, I'm like, fifty percent of the time, I'm always joking. Like, yeah, a hundred percent, fifty percent of the time, I'm joking every time. <laughs> Dude, uh, you I, never really know whether I'm being serious. <laughs> it is yeah. a real thing. I think netcode is a real thing, but still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was a couple of things. Like when it came to, because I've, I've grown up playing fighting games, and then I. As I started to get more like into the FTC scene, I want to say probably a year, year and a half ago, mm. there were tournaments I was hearing people throw around like frame data and and um, 
what's the other one? It says frame data. There's um, God, why am I drawing blanks? Frame data, input latency, input In, lag. Yeah. yeah. Input lag. Eight there's frames. That. <laughs> yeah. And it's like people, people are like talking about this and I'm hearing them throw terms around. I was like, wait, were people talking about this in the arcades when I was going? Because I do not remember hearing any of these terms. Like, is, this a, <laughs> yeah. is this a science class? What yeah. is this? <laughs> well, it's like it's like all the videos that what's his name, Justin, Justin, Justin. I was trying to I just, I just tried to marry Justin, uh, Justin Wong and James Chen. James Chen. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was saying that it was it was because of Street Fighter Five that it became more relevant, right? Because different moves have are my, different minus values, and I yeah. think before it wasn't really as specific as that. It's like Pretty much every move is minus. You don't you don't just throw out any move by accident. But like yeah. Street Fighter Five, it's like there are moves that are one hundred percent safe that totally shouldn't be. <laughs> I'm gonna throw that button <laughs> out all the time. <laughs> oh, oh man! man. Uh, speak, speaking of Street Fighter Five, I know you said um, you got it at launch. I mean, I got it at launch myself, and I think we both mutually disliked it for the longest. I actually stepped away from that game until I want to say season three because Cody wow, was okay. in it. Cody was my main in Street Fighter 4 and Street Fighter Alpha 3. Uh, so when I he got announced, I was like, are you guys serious? And then I... And the, the, I, the trailer was incredible as well. It was. It was like the it best was. trailer I've ever seen for anything. I was like, oh my God, Street Fighter is back. <laughs> what the heck? This trailer is so good. <laughs> so, so what brought you back to uh, Street Fighter 5? Was it... Ibuki or mm, I didn't know Ibuki was in Street Fighter Five when I bought it. To be quite honest, mm -hmm. I don't. Well, I don't think I knew. Was she in Top Eight 2017? Either can't remember. Uh, I would say mm, I think so. Well, maybe she was. I'm not sure she was definitely in the game because she's season two, right? She's season two, and, and 2017 was season two and a half ish. So I know she was in the game, but I just I didn't wasn't really that conscious of it. It was just it was more that I watched the whole Punk Tokido thing happen. At mm. Evo 2017, well, on stream, I wasn't there. I've never been to Evo, but I, I watched it on stream. <laughs> and I was like, dude, this is really hype and really exciting. I really want to play this game. And I think I also, I had recently done a video on my Mobile Studio Pro, or maybe it was after, I can't remember what the order was, but I was like, hey, I finally got a laptop that could run Steam. It's time to to play this game. And I, I, and actually, we still didn't have arcade mode. Can you believe it? <laughs> Season two. <laughs> <laughs> season two, we still didn't even have an arcade mode in that game, which is funny because now that we have it, nobody plays it. Now that we've got it, nobody plays it. <laughs> We're so typical. We're just the worst consumers ever. But um, so arcade mode wasn't there on launch, and I was like, I don't play online, so I got rid of it. So mm. it was two years later. That I finally came back to Street Fighter, and it was from watching the Punk Tokido thing. I thought that was really hype. My Mobile Studio Pro ran Windows, which had Steam, so I bought it on Steam, and then I got the that Hori Mini. It's called the Hori Fighting Stick Mini Four. Yeah, I thought it. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty good value for money at the time. But then after two or three months, like it doesn't register inputs anymore. It's like you press down, nothing happens. You have to push <laughs> down, you have to push hard down. It's pressure sensitive. It's analog now. <laughs> it's not even trying to be analog, but it's analog now. So I didn't realize that it would break so easily. But unfortunately, I had bought the Hori RAP 4 or 5. I don't really know. It doesn't have a number on it. Mm -hmm. And that was just the slippery slip. And it, it, to be honest, it's like every hobby for me. It's when I discover some gear aspect of it that I start to really get into it. So I think what happened was watching all the stuff online was exciting. But then I was like, okay, I'm going to put dip my foot into it by buying this arcade stick. And it was after that I was like, hey, I could I can master this tool for no real reason. It won't benefit my life at all. But that's the, the negative way to look at it. The, the positive way is like <laughs> absolutely completely the opposite, right? Now I've met millions, not millions of people, but a large number of people that I never would have met if I hadn't mm -hmm. got into fighting games at all, right? But it's like that's what I feel is the common theme for like my entire life is picking up yo-yo and it's it's just for the longest time a massive grind with no real feedback and it's mm -hmm. like arcade sticks it's like wow i'm just gonna have to grind down with this it's the same thing when you learn the flute when you learn the trumpet when you learn percussion you just have to grind for a while and see nothing 
But then, I don't know, do you have the grade system, the associated board system of music in Hawaii? I believe we do. You have like grade eight. So you can go like grade one to grade eight. And then after grade eight, you can do your diploma and then you can get a degree in the in performance, right? Mm -hmm. It's grades one to four feel like, why are my parents making me do this? But then you get to like grade, actually, no, grade one to five are like, why are my parents making me do this? What a waste of my life. You get to grade <laughs> six and you're like, hey, how's it going? My name's Nihongo. I, uh, I play the drums. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I don't, I'm just kidding. It's not actually like that. But you know, you know, it's like you, you start to realize, whoa, someone made me practice this thing so I could excel at something. And you are you end up being really, really grateful to your parents for getting you dedicated to anything because then you can put that dedication to anything that you want to do later. Like you want to learn how to draw, fine. You want to be good at accounting, fine. It's like those same skills that you learned on how to play the drums to level grade eight, basically. Mm -hmm. You become, you, you really reap the benefits of excelling at something. And I think sticks are the same. Arcade sticks are kind of the same thing. See, I, I think my parents would disagree with you because <laughs> all the years- My parents, hey, my you... parents disagree with me as well. <laughs> <laughs> they beat you to it. <laughs> like all the years that I had to play violin, drums, guitar, uh, stand-up bass, cello, flute, I'm over here like, yeah, I can still play it. And they're like, okay, so read these notes. Yeah, no. no I... <laughs> <laughs> mm. Now the reading music thing is, it's a shame actually, because reading music isn't, has never really been the point of music. From the beginning, writing down music was just so that it doesn't get lost. The only yeah. way to pass it down to people was to write it down. But I think if in the old days of Gregorian chant and madrigals and plain song, in those days, if they had CD recorders, if they could have been able to record those WAV files to CD, they would never have bothered to write any of it down. So written music, of course, opens up your world to a world of really exciting things. But when people, when you're trying to get your kids into music, like the coolest thing I think to do would be to show them all these artists who don't know a thing about reading music and went through their entire lives becoming the greatest selling jazz guitar artists of the world and died still probably not being able to read a note of it. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that just proves it's like, of course there are benefits to being able to read music, but that's not the heart of it really. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I guitar. <laughs> oh my god like my parents would get so it, between my parents and the bands that i've been in they'd be so annoyed with me because they're like why are you not they're like it's right there on the sheet music you need to play this and i'm like i can't read it <laughs> i'm like if i if you if you can tell me or textualize it or if i can hear it i can play it but if i if you're trying to show me on paper i can't mm. i can't at all and it is funny because i'm the only one out of my uh i'm the youngest of six and the others, all my other siblings, they can sing, they can dance, they can play music, they can read music. I can do everything but read music. And I constantly, to this day, get shit from them about that. <laughs> so honestly, it's like it's like when you're trying to convince friends to play fighting games. You're just like, look, if you could only just understand that you put your left hand on this right. part and your right hand <laughs> on this part, it's not that hard. You know, and you would just, because in your mind, it really isn't that hard. How could you be getting this wrong? But a lot of people are just like, look, I just never got the, I just never figured out the whole stick thing, so I don't play fighting games. You're like, oh, that's such a shame. And now we're coming around to it. We're like, well, I suppose you could play on pad. Do you want to play on pad? I guess everyone plays on pad now. We're conceding <laughs> to it. And I guess that's what it's like for music. It's like, they're like, why can't you just figure out how to read music? Okay, well, I guess you could play rock guitar and the blues. I guess you don't really need sheet music for that, but you've missed the point. It's like, well, you haven't missed the point. It's amazing to be able to play any any kind of music. Yeah. I actually on that on on that specific story, this is going on a slight tangent, but I, I guarantee you it is sort of relevant. Go for it. How how parents will try and get you into a certain thing and they mm -hmm. can't understand why you won't just learn how to read sheet music. And this thing happened where there was a pianist. So he's, there was a professional piano masterclass. And I think, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to quote the name of the conductor who said this because I might get it wrong. There's a lot of famous conductors, but he mm -hmm. sat down next to the kid on the piano. He was like, all right, play the, play the piece, play the music. 
So he plays the music and so he's just like, it's just not, it's just not right. He's not right. He's like, I don't know. I just, I just not, I just can't get into it. He's just like, no, 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 play, play it again, play it again. He's like, da, 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 da. it's like, no, nah, it's not quite right. Oh, hang on a sec, hang on a second. Sit, uh, sit like this. He's like, what? Like, like this was like a terrible, terrible posture. It was like this. <laughs> and he's like, okay, now play it. He's like, okay, you're the boss. He plays it. He's like, da, 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 da. he's like, what happened? That was amazing. He's like, the thing is, you're a one cheek pianist. <laughs> you have to sit on one butt cheek to play your best. <laughs> he was he was being forced to learn the piano through the same shape that everyone else was being forced. Just like mm -hmm. when we're trying to force our friends to play fighting games, we're like, it's got to be through stick. But actually, maybe their way to fighting games isn't through stick. Maybe it's through pad, or maybe it's through all these, like, have you seen these controllers for people who don't have hands, people who don't have feet? Right. They've got assistive controllers for handicapped people. And... That I'll never forget that story because it's like not everyone fits that same mold, but they can yeah. still enjoy the the fun of fighting games or the fun of music or any of these things. You're a, you're a one cheek pianist. What? <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out I reckon I reckon Daigo is the same. Have you seen all these? Actually, I've got one right here. What a coincidence! It's not really a coincidence, is it? Because your brain your brain just instinctively mentions things that are relevant to you right now. But this is. <laughs> This is the, the Daigo manga, right? Mm -hmm. And in, I don't know which episode, well, pretty much any, any, any one of these panels, you'll be able to find a, a point where he's, there, there is, right here, right here. Daigo, oh. Daigo's sitting down at one of these Astro Sissy cabinets or whatever, which I don't know what cabinet it is, but in the manga, he always has to sit sideways. Mm -hmm. He never sat down at the machine and just played straight on. He was always had his legs crossed and he had his arms to the side and he's kind of, playing in this terrible posture. He's a one-cheek fighting gamer. <laughs> what if he had never discovered that? What if he had been forced to sit straight like this? Maybe he would never have been able to unlock his beast potential. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Who ended up, who'd, who'd have thought we'd have ended up talking about professional piano, piano players? Right? <laughs> hey, that's, that's the benefit of organic conversations. You never know where true. they're going to go. <laughs> that's true. That's also the risk. <laughs> The double edged blade, the double dragon. Dude, I can't how many times I've had conversations go from A to F, and I'm like, wait, um We used to be interesting. What happened? <laughs> like, wait, did we did we take a fork in a row? Was there a pit stop here? I, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, well it's funny how my, my brain always thinks that something I'm about to say is very, very relevant, and then I'll finish the story and I'm like, so it's actually not that relevant, is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish I could have seen that before, but I, I had not foreseen. <laughs> oh, ah. So what's so, so what's next? <laughs> uh, so the other thing I want to talk about, since mm. I know you play King of Fighters 14. Yes. So, not, right, not recently, but yeah. So why do you think it is as good as that game is? It came out the same year as uh, Street Fighter V. Why are more people not playing it? Is it because SNK fell out of prominence in the early 2000s? Or I don't know. Like I, I, I've yet to figure it out. I think there's a lot to be said with fighting games and momentum. Mm -hmm. and when people talk about fighting game communities and, and the scene, they're not really exaggerating. It really, like, the scene really can dictate. Well, the scene is all the game is. When the game is only a game. It's only a disc and a physical product before it goes out into the masses. But once it goes out into the masses, it no longer is just program code. It's now in the minds of people, right? And mm -hmm. the, if it doesn't stay in the minds of people, the game can basically cease to exist. The, the people say like the game is dead. It's like it actually kind of is sort of dead. If no one is playing it and no one's talking about it and no one's thinking about it, then does the game even really exist? It's like if the tree fell in the wood and no one's there to see it. Yeah, <laughs> sort of thing. So I think with King of Fighters, I'm I'm pretty sure it's not completely dead because they had the tournament at Evo Japan, right? I think Evo Japan yeah. 2019, and people are still playing it, but people aren't making as much YouTube content about it as well. Here's here's the other thing: is the internet would like you to think that whatever's on YouTube is the whole world, and YouTube does a really good job of making us think that what's happening on YouTube is everything, yeah. and we're easily tricked by it. 
It's, it's like, well, actually, you leave YouTube for one day. Or, well, not just YouTube. You leave Twitter for one day, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. People like this game, and they play this game. It's just Twitter that doesn't like it. <laughs> so I think it's, it's a little bit dangerous to talk about, like, the life and death of games online, because that's not where they live, anyway. Where they live is in the hands of people actually playing it. Yeah. If there, I mean, but truth be told, it clearly isn't being played and isn't as popular as we'd like it to be, right? KOF 14. And, well, first of all, there's the lack of momentum at the start because of the visual. They didn't, they didn't promise that they were going to fix it. They were just like, here's the game, and if you'll buy it at this level of quality, then uh, that should be fine. And I think it was like a bonus. Six months later, they're like, oh, by the way, we made a visual upgrade. It's just like... Well, where was all this gung ho before? Like, why didn't you just, you know, why didn't you just gamble on the game being successful and put them work in before you released it? But that's that was the start, actually. I think of yeah. games releasing not complete, and Street Fighter Five was the same. It's like, let's just release it not finished, and then if it doesn't succeed, we'll just do nothing else with it. But what we would really have liked is to can you just finish the game and then charge us for it? Because <laughs> charging us before is just not not cool anymore. So there's that. The game itself, though. Uh, it's mechanically sound. Mechanically sound, but lacking. Because I recently played this, actually, with, with a friend. We, I've got a, an old-time friend. We used to play King of Fighters together. Mm -hmm. And we played them back-to-back. -back. We played 12, because I had it on Steam. So we are like, 12, 13, 14. Let's just try them all. Mm -hmm. And we're like... Yeah, let's just play thirteen. And we just we, we played we, well, we played twelve and thirteen, and they were like, "Look, let's just refresh our memory. What is fourteen like?" We went back into fourteen, and so it's like, it's not, it's not the same. It's not the same. And the animations do matter, and the characters do matter, and you hear people talk about this on YouTube all the time. The presentation does matter, and the game isn't just code and programming. When we're playing these characters, we believe that they're real actual human characters out there doing cool moves mm -hmm. but if they were stick figures and we saw exactly what they were which is why frame data also kind of kills the joy of it as well because it's like mm -hmm. oh now i know exactly why i lost it wasn't because that was an amazing read it's because that's minus two and why would you do that after someone throws out a minus two move or something you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like oh that's just a frame trap everyone does that so i think actually the design of the games does actually kind of change the joy of it you can't just be mechanically sound it has to resound in our hearts make us want to carry it with us everywhere and tell everyone to play it but i don't really tell all my friends to play ko 14. i'm like oh you might i say it sometimes i'll be like hey you might like king of fighters 14. if you liked kof there's a new this is the newest one it's got all this ex stuff ex is fun and it's it, like no doubt about it it is fun but i don't <clears throat> rant i don't rave about it to my friends i'm like you gotta play this game kof 14. I don't tell them about Street Fighter V either. I know, I'm, like, I'm, I'm like, you've got to play Street Fighter V. It's so hype. Oh my god, it's amazing. I just <laughs> like it. And I, if I think I find someone who might also like Street Fighter V, I might suggest it to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Final Fantasy VII is the opposite. Even if you don't play role-playing games, I'd be like, you have got to play Final Fantasy VII. They'd be like, I'm sorry, I'm not even a gamer. I don't play games. I was like, that's fine. That's fine. But this is an experience that I cannot live without you not having. So please join me. <laughs> Let's play Final Fantasy VII. You know what I mean? Yeah. Final Fantasy VII will be the one that you always tell your friends. I don't know about yourself, but personally, it's one I'll always tell my friends. Tell people I've never even met. I'll be like, play Final Fantasy VII. Let's play it. Let's play it. No, I mean, and that one was the one. That was actually my first Final Fantasy. And it is still in my top ten. Actually, I'd say it's my in my top three. <laughs> it's just the story, the universe of it. Um, I'm just ready for them to do the next chapter. I've been waiting since the <laughs> Dirty Cerberus. I'm like, okay, um, Genesis is back. So where are we going with this? <laughs> are they? Are they? Uh, were there any plans to continue the story? I mean, I didn't play Dirty Cerberus. I owned it, but I didn't really get that far into it. I think um, we're all just waiting for the remake. I yeah, which I, might I, exist. <laughs> well, I, I think the other thing too is the fact that they there's so much retconning. So there's a Cerberus retconned a lot from seven. Then Advent Children did a lot of retconning, and then there mm. was the spin-off games, uh the mobile mm. one. 
that did retconning, and then you had um the one with Zach, which it's the first mm. game to ever make me cry. Crisis Core. Yes, it's the first and only one that ever okay. made me cry. I, I was it. messed up. At you didn't the cry at FF Seven, you heartless monster. I I <laughs> I, 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 sh I shed a thug tear <laughs> for, for Aerith. But I remember, that... I remember when yeah, when stuff happened in FF Seven. Like, oh, actually, my brother played every game that I played about thirty minutes ahead of me, and then mm -hmm. he would he would watch me play, and he would like spoil things as I go. He's like, oh, this is about to happen, and this is about to happen. I was like, don't say anything. <laughs> and I think when I won't yeah spoil it for anyone, but when stuff happens in FF Seven, he he's like, I sh I can't spoil this. This is like I can spoil everything in the game. That's fine. Chocobos, gold saucers. Breeding, everything. Spoil it. Emerald weapon, whatever. But this storyline, I'm just gonna stay quiet. And then he watched me play it. And I was like, what is happening? My world <laughs> is turning upside down. You can't do this to the player. Yeah, so FF7. Is FF7 was a real, like, on a, if you were to break it down, like on a psychological level, that game really messed with you. With Oh every, God, it's still messing with me to the, this I, day. <laughs> Every time Sephiroth showed up, I was oh, like, God. and that music? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and, and you know what's even better about Final Fantasy VII music is the titles on the CD for that. Yeah. The titles for the CDs are like, Trail of Blood. So it's like, what? <laughs> oh my God, that's even scarier. But it's 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 hilarious. I, I talked about this a lot. Actually, so my, my undergraduate dissertation was Final Fantasy VII. I read about the narrative role of music because mm -hmm. back then they didn't have voices, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the expressive information, which is dictated to you by speech, by full motion video, and by background synchronized music. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that back then. And in many ways, it meant that the music had to do the job of pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. Atmosphere had to be music. Voices, there were no voices. So the characters' voices were their theme songs. There was just, the excitement level, the hype, the fear, everything had to be done, or not everything, a lot of things had to be done by music that music doesn't have to do these days. And as a result but of being unsynchronized music, your, your brain did the same thing that you would do when you read a really good book. It's just, mm -hmm. it fills in all the gaps. And that's yeah. why I feel like FF7 is this epic adventure, which is as crazy as the person who, who plays it in any <laughs> game of that. And that's why retro games are still really popular and people were really excited about Hey, what was that game that came out on Switch? Do you remember? It was like an RPG by Square. Oh, oh uh, Octopath, Octopath Traveler. Octopath Traveler. I think yeah. people were really excited about that because they remember the feels of playing FF6 on the Super Nintendo. Yeah. Like, why was that game so hype? It didn't have full motion video. It didn't have synchronized music. It didn't have voices or anything. And yet everyone remembers it really well because in their minds, it played out like the best movie they ever saw. And yeah. and I this is something I just want to say before I forget because we were talking about why do you think KOF didn't, go and be as successful as it, as it probably deserves to be. Mm -hmm. There's a video of a TED talk where a guy's talking about like, how do, how do YouTube videos become viral? And he's like, essentially, it has to be remarkable. You can't just be funny and you can't be interesting and you can't be divisive and you can't be provocative. It's, those are all just things that any video can be. But if a video is remarkable, as in, you want to make a remark about it. You want to tell someone about it. That's mm -hmm. how a video becomes viral. And I think that's how fighting games, the ones that really stuck with us, are the ones that, the ones that were remarkable. And that's why, that's why Third Strike, even though probably a lot of people hated playing it when it was actually out, but the moment 37 happened, <laughs> but the game, but the but moment 37 happened and it spread like wildfire and still does to this day. Every documentary, name a fighting doc game documentary that comes out in 2018 or 2019 that doesn't have a clip of Evo, Evo Moment 37. Have we really got so few moments that we have to play the only one that was ever interesting? <laughs> <laughs> it really is that boring. I'm so sorry. There was only this one time that it was kind of interesting. But I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of joking. It really actually was that hype. And it was that remarkable that we're like, you guys have gone to play this game, Street Fighter. Oh my God, stuff happens in this game. I wish I could tell you everything <laughs> that happens. Yeah. <sighs> I'm so cynical. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, dude, I love it. I love it. I love it. No, dude, because it makes it actually brings me back to '97. God, I'm I'm showing my age, people. 
I remember <laughs> when Street Fighter 3 first came in arcades and people hated it. <laughs> yeah, they were like, coming what off. What is this? Yeah, they're like, oh, it looks good, but it plays like <laughs> They're like it's slow, it's crappy. Like I remember people hated it, and it's funny. Yeah. You jump twenty years forward, I think it's twenty years. I think yeah, my my math is right. I, I suck at math. It's close. It's close. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you jump twenty years later, and everyone's like, "Oh, it's the holy grail." And I'm like, <laughs> "Wow, okay." <laughs> Everyone, I mean, especially in the fighting game community, the the rose tinted spectacles, as they're called. They're very rosy. Yeah. <laughs> but people are going to look back on Street Fighter V. They're going to be like, oh, mate, do you remember how epic it was? We had V-Triggers, V-Trigger 2. Do you remember when the Cody announcement came out? That was so hyped. We're going to completely forget how, 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 how many people... I don't even want to say it was hated. I, don't want, I, I would just say how vocally negative we were on the internet about it. And it's funny because I feel like with every Street Fighter that's come out... <laughs> I feel like it's the same song and dance. <laughs> like I remember when four was out, people hated four. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so I remember them hating four. I remember them hating three. Uh, <laughs> and it's like now all of a sudden they just hate. Like, oh, this game is so bad. Like I, I just hate <laughs> Fighter Five. And I'm like, okay, so when six comes out, you're gonna find everything about it to hate it. It's either they don't have my character. All the mechanics. We'll or... find something, yeah. Oh <laughs> There's no comeback factor in this game. We need V triggers. <laughs> we'll come up with something. We'll come up with something. It's I like think. That. I think it's such a okay. shame because fighting games. Anyone who is part of fighting games knows how incredibly passionate people are, and I yeah. think it's a double-edged blade, isn't it? Because people are so passionate, it means that they're so critical of their baby because their fighting game. Their of, of choice is their baby. And yeah. their, the parent will always be like the most critical person of their own baby. And, yeah. and on the outside, especially with Twitter, all people will hear is the negative stuff. And they won't know that people are saying it tongue in cheek. It's just like, this game is so dumb. It's like, I'm still playing it for eight hours of my day, seven days a week to be a professional gamer. It's like, it's funny because of the context. I'm spending yeah. my entire life playing it, and that's why it's okay for me to say these stupid things. But Twitter is very selective, and people will only hear what they want to hear. And that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But that's just what people we don't realize is that every negative thing we say may be the only thing that someone hears about this game. So, and you never know when, when it will be taken out of context. Like all those <laughs> Twitter channels, out of context Kirby or out of context Zelda. <laughs> They're great. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes me think of that other fighting game. Um, I've been playing this like crazy, fighting EX Lair. I love that game. Really? I love it. You love and, it? Yeah, like I, I played that like crazy. I was playing uh, Under Night and Birth before it became popular. Like now, oh, oh, like, oh, I see. Yeah, you liked Metallica <laughs> before before they went big and all that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't listen to anything after Ride the Lightning. Yeah, sure. I know right. your type. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, like I, I look at. People were playing units before it blew up after the Evo announcement. <laughs> yeah, like you know, and, and like with fighting EX Lair, like I'm enjoying it. I, I love the the speed of it. I like the inputs. I love the graphics. Like I think graphically it looks amazing. But again, it's another game where it's really good, but it has almost no promotion behind it. It's not in the, the, the mind of the people. And a lot of people I've talked to in the FTC, they're like, "Yeah, I I'm interested, but my friends are not interested in playing it." I'm like, if you guys are complaining so much about Street Fighter V, play the game that was <laughs> the original 3D Street Fighter back in the 90s. Mm. Like, but Well, uh, I think it's <clears throat> like, it'll be like this for every fighting game. It's basically, you know when you go to a party and mm -hmm. you go in and they're playing hip hop and you're like, guys, System of a Down is so much more interesting than hip hop. Let's play System of a Down. You put it on the CD player and they're like, which, get out. Which it is. Get out. <laughs> it's a party. It's a party. Get, get out of here with your system of a down. You're like, okay, I'm going to go to a different room with my own CD player. And you're the only, the problem is you're the only person in the room. It's like, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. That's basically what it is. You're, you're in a room crying with your system of a down. It's not a party. And that's why, I mean, basically you need that momentum and it can't just be you. Yeah. If you want a game to survive, you need a scene 
and you need to build up that scene. Just like you need room number two with System of a Down to build up. And it, or, to be honest, at the parties I went to, eventually it would build up. You'd, you'd sit in there with your System of a Down and then all the metal heads would come in and then all the, <laughs> all the hip hop people would be like, yo, it's happening in here. I want to be part of this. <laughs> and it, it, would, it would eventually happen. But, it, but you need that first person to go in there and enjoy it and play the game. And it's a lonely party at first. So that's, that's yeah. just how it is. <laughs> And that's why people won't leave Street Fighter Five yet, is because it's a lonely party everywhere else. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is true. And you know, I, I want to ask you, like, um, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Samurai Showdown that's going to be at Evo? I'm, to be honest, I'm very surprised that that's going to be at Evo after <laughs> it's been like I don't know how how long it's been since Six came out. It's been, you know what I would say. I don't know why you're surprised because cross tag <laughs> cross tag was a main evo game and it hadn't even come out yet so isn't this just normal for games to True. or wait are you surprised because it's so soon after a different samurai showdown game or are you surprised just because how can it be an evo if it hasn't been like released yet because it's been so long and the fact that oh. a lot of people it does not seem like snk has the prominence now that it used to mm, back in true the 90s 2000s so i'm shocked yeah, I'm not really sure either. what the business. Yeah, I'm not really sure what the business decision was there. Like, yo, we should really just do KOF 15, and we should do it with really great graphics this time. No, how about we revive Samurai Showdown? It's like, what are you talking? That really crazy game where like you do one hit and then suddenly you're dead. You think people are gonna like that? Yeah, that was punishing and it hurt. They're gonna love it. <laughs> These masochistic street fighter players, they're gonna love this stuff. <laughs> That's pretty much. I, I honestly don't know what the business decision decision was there. I think it looked cool though. It could it also does. just be that anything related to, but you know what, with Claymore or SNK, I don't know what they call themselves now, but you know they got um, they the, uh, they got bought out by that Chinese company and they were just like, look, KOF is just a brand. There's yeah. going to be a fighting game, but there's also going to be the mobile game and the other mobile game and the other mobile game. And there's going to be a lot of mobile games <laughs> based around King of Fighters. And I think what happens is you just look at it in a board meeting and go, wow, we released eight King of Fighters games and they all flopped. We definitely can't make another King of Fighters game when really what they probably needed to do was to make KOF 15 to out, like undo all of the other KOF stuff that had, had come out maybe. But no, they were just like, eh, it would be safer to just have a completely brand new title. <laughs> I don't know how they thought that was going to be safe. But you know, we'll see. People seem hyped about it. Personally, yeah. I didn't really play a lot of Samurai Showdown. I mean, of course I played it, Lost Blade, Samurai Showdown. You hear about SNK, just like, I'm going to try them all. But I never really understood like how to play Samurai Showdown that well. I think it looks really cool. I don't think yeah. it looks super high quality, but it looks high quality enough that it would be interesting to play. OK. But, um... Yeah. Cross tag, cross tag made it as a main title, so I'm kind of like nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Anything could happen. So, uh, what are your thoughts so far on like uh, Dead or Alive Six? Ah, I love the game. Have you been playing? Yeah. So I um I'm 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 a Jan Lee fan, and I think oh, it's yeah? just because I <laughs> really can do. I love his character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, probably look like him. If I take my glasses off, I can probably look like him. <laughs> I'll have to take my shirt off as well. I won't, I won't go that far. Not today. <laughs> That's episode two. So subscribe to Mikel Casanova, the number one podcast in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not coming in the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I personally, Dead or Alive 6. So you've been enjoying it. Do, I mean, did you play Dead or Alive 5 a lot? I, yes. So I've been, I played Dead or Alive ever since it first came out. I, I had a Saturn back in the day. So I play the original. I play two, two hardcore. I play. I mean, yes, you also like Coldplay before they were big as well. And <laughs> yeah. I've always liked it as an alternative to uh, Virtua Fighter. I, I've always just viewed it as a faster, more offense based Virtua Fighter. But I know a lot of people, they just don't take it seriously. I know with five, they tried to make it more of a mm. serious fighter but then there's a perception people were like oh it's just a titty fighter I'm like, no. yeah. <laughs> there is there is that i i would say that it's it's probably all i think the people who don't really like dead or alive today are probably never really ever going to get around to liking dead or alive 5. it's not really just a gameplay element it's just like there's enough elements about this game that it doesn't jive right with them personally 
because I'm a fan, I, I, I like that it's got cute girls in it, so I think that's definitely like a plus for me. Yeah. <laughs> but playing the game just as a fighting game as well, I actually thought I was going to dislike it, to be quite honest. I thought, because I didn't really play a lot of five, I own it, I own five last round, mm -hmm. and I, I used to, I used to like, play it with friends. It's like, oh, this is hilarious. We never know who's going to win because this game is so random. You, you either hold, you don't know if you're going to hold, you're going to press the button. That's what I didn't like about Dead or Alive 5. I was like, at any some any random point, you could just decide, you could just guess to do a hold instead. And suddenly yeah. my attack is now, I'm eating damage. And I hated that. I was like, I don't want to guess. I want to be so good at manipulating this tool that I always win. <laughs> and that's, that's the, that's the, what's the word? That was the misunderstand not misunderstanding. It was like a misapprehension. I was yeah. under the under the impression that you could master it so well that the most skillful player always wins. But that's absolutely not what fighting games are in the current generation, especially. Yeah. It's not about being it's of course, of course, the most skillful players are cons consistently place placing top eight. But that's not all this look, don't don't joke there's no you can't beat about the bush on this one there is some lucky guesses <laughs> in this game <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose so dead or alive I, did, I didn't think i was going to enjoy it and now i really like that aspect of it and like okay reads i get it it's a read if i read it properly it's a guess if i guess wrong that's like the most common viewpoint on on reads right I love that. <laughs> if you guess wrong it was a guess if you guess right it's a read i love that one <laughs> But yeah, so, what do, what do, what do you like? I don't like. I didn't like that. That was that's the triangle system, right? Holds. Yeah. I didn't like that. Holds was you know I like KOF characters like Kasumi. She's got a counter that makes her a counter character, but yeah. every single character has counters. I don't know if I'm gonna like that. And then I I really I'm really into it right now. I played three every stream last week was a dead a live stream. I'm really into it. Yeah. Well, what's what's your favorite character? Um, over. Well, since they won't put Misaki in from Venus Vacation from the mobile game, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them to put Misaki in. But until Misaki arrives, I'd say my character choices were Ayane, Murray Rose, those two basically, and then <laughs> <laughs> and then I started playing Murray Rose like the past two weeks. But then I really just the reason I stayed away from Murray Rose before was like I didn't get it. Like this person jumps weird. She. She doesn't seem to be a martial artist. She's like not ready to fight and all the jumps and moves. Are, oh, sorry, killing the mic. <laughs> and then I changed over to Kasumi uh, yeah. a couple of days ago. I was like, oh, this works so much better for me. So I'm, I'm actually wondering if maybe I should, I need basically, I need to go through all the characters, but I really like Kasumi right now. I would say next character you should use is Ayane. You'll like her. Yeah, I'll go back. I'll, I'll go back to Ayane. So I didn't really learn the game properly with Ayane. I just did like all the combo challenges. I, yeah. That's the stage I'm at still. I'm like, can I even put these buttons <laughs> in the right order and get the combos out? And I got through that with Ayane and Murray Rose, and I'm really enjoying Kasumi. But yeah, I think I'll probably end up going back to Ayane and revisiting that one. Who's your character in Dead or Alive? Um, number one, Jan Lee. Number two is usually Ayn, which he's missing in this one. They'll probably put Is he a Virtua Fighter character? Or is he just no, not no, in no. the game? He's just no, actually just not in the game. He's not in this one, but... Um, <laughs> like, no reason. Usually they add him in. He's the uh, alter ego of Hayari. Oh. He's a powerful version of um, Hitomi. Mm. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm waiting for them to put him in because it's usually... And also I want them to put the tag mode back in because usually my team is Jan Lee and Ayn. And I just dominate with those two. Well, here's this is actually quite an important thing. Like we're talking about like DLC characters and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And I think absolutely aspects of the game that have nothing to do with the gameplay can kind of kill it in the minds of people. So oh, Dead or Alive, like the, yeah. the DLC thing. Yeah. A lot of people, like myself included, I was like, look, if you don't like the DLC practices, just don't buy it. Don't buy the season pass if you don't like it. Just play the game and enjoy it for what it is. But you can't get away from the fact that their attitude to DLC just sets the tone for the attitude to the game in general. It's like, yeah. what is this game to you, Tecmo? Well, esports is a big thing now. We ought to churn out a game that looks pretty much the same as Dota Alive 5. Mechanically, a lot of things have changed, but
but more or less, it is not that different looking. And it's, it's like, it's, it's really not a significantly different game. And so when the season pass thing happened, which basically if anyone's not aware of this, they released this $100 season pass that said you get all the costumes and you can't buy the costumes separately. So the only way to buy these costumes is to buy the season pass right now. Like they may change that, but there's buy the seasons for $16, $20 each or $100 yeah. for all of the season. Yeah. And even if I don't buy them, it tells me already a lot that I need to know about the company. And the same thing happens with Apple and Samsung, right? I'm not yeah. a big fan of a lot of things that both companies do. But when I heard that Samsung also has a weapons division and they're in charge of the missiles that are uh, manufactured, they manufacture the missiles that control like borders in Korea or something. I was like, mm. I don't want my money to go to it. Like, to be honest, my money that goes to Apple is probably also going to missiles somewhere. But probably <laughs> as far as I know, as far as I know, it isn't. And so if I can make these decisions, it's like we can't rule out that aspects that have nothing to do with the game can affect the game. If your attitude shows that you're the type of company that is out it at it for the money, then it will change how we view the game, even if it's not relevant. Same with, yeah. I don't want to say it, but it's Marvel versus Capcom Infinite. <laughs> it, does, <laughs> it does affect, I guess I said it, I said it. It does affect, it does affect how people see the game, even if it's not relevant to the game. Your attitude yeah. to how you designed this thing does does affect it it's such a shame isn't it though it is and if you think about <laughs> it too that's the same thing that kind of killed off street fire cross tekken and gems yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah yeah the, yeah that was such a shame because now we're totally down with it we're like look of course they make dlc before the game is out like okay maybe putting it on the disc was a bit of an extravagant not extravagant it was a bold it was a daft move, basically. It really but was. now I think we would we wouldn't be that surprised now. I think if Street Fighter Five, if Street Fighter Six shows up and DLC characters are already on the disc, I think mm. we'd be like, look, of course, why would you wait? Why not develop new characters if you've got some spare time mm. while the beta is being tested? Put them on the disc. It'll save us the download later. <laughs> we know that you need to make money, and we want to give you money. That's why we keep asking you to give us more stuff. <laughs> so we're down with it now. But at the time, yeah, Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Bad timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, and, and you know, winding down to the last couple of questions because I, I definitely want to be respectful of your time. Um, oh, and, and yours as well. Thank you. No, I, the day is yours. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a king. Thank you. <laughs> this is good. No, this is great fun. This is great fun. Great, great. Um, uh, I want to ask you um, with your your fighting stick. So you've got yours customized by Vitrix. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I've yet to use the Vitrix Pro FS, but everyone I know from, you know, my friend that runs in Sergo to uh, Justin Wong and many others, they're telling me, like, dude, there's nothing like this stick. This thing feels like you're, it's, it's like the Maserati fighting sticks. I'm like, mm. I will, I will describe it like this. And I just happen to have these sticks lying around, so I'm just going to pick them up. But I've got stuff like this, right? This is the Nintendo Switch stick, right? The mm -hmm. Hori Risa stick. Mm -hmm. And you've got one of these as well, right? This is a Mad Cats TE2 yep. Plus. And actually, they go up in price that way. The cheaper one is the Hayabusa. The more expensive one is the TE2 Plus. And then the most expensive one is the, the Victrix, right? Mm -hmm. And when people say that it feels really good to play, it's, how do I describe it? It's not trying to be, I don't think it's actually trying to be a more high performance stick because the people who make this stuff, they know that there's, there's kind of a limit. You need up, down, left, right, punch, 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 kick, kick, kick. If it can mm -hmm. do that, you can play the game. And yeah. if it's got some more hardware in it, then it's already decided how it's going to feel. There's really nothing else that you can change about it, apart from the placement and the quality of life aspects, like the USB cable. So, I mean, I talked about this in my, my videos and stuff, but it's just a removable cable, some well thought out controls, some flashing lights. It's nice and cool to the touch. It feels nice. And that's basically what's more important with this stick, is that if you've ever put on a Hugo Boss suit, mm -hmm. 
No one else has any idea that you're wearing a Hugo Boss suit and nobody cares, right? But when you put on the suit, you're like, yo, I just put on the suit. I'm gonna do <laughs> that's, that's all, that's all, oh, sorry, sorry, whoa. Rest in peace, microphone. Um, <laughs> that's all, that's all this is. And you can kind of tell that these are the, this is, this is a different way of thinking about your company. You are not toy makers and we're not just trying to make the, the thing that will make, because toys are not designed to be fun to play with, right? They're just designed to look great to kids on the box so that they'll want to nag their parents to buy it for them right. and bring it home. And with suits, let's face it, every suit is exactly the freaking same. They all look the same. Mm -hmm. It's a jacket and a pair of trousers. There's really nothing else you can do to it <laughs> to make it better. But when you put on a suit that says Hugo Boss and you know that it costs a lot of money and you also know that it's made of more expensive materials, you know that technically it should probably also last a bit longer. It's all these, it's got all these things that supposedly are different and they are different on a day-to-day -day basis. They make no difference whatsoever. Basically, if your stick has a Sanwa stick and Sanwa buttons in it, you're going to be fine. You're going to be able to play your fighting games. The people who buy the victories are the people who, well, they want to put on the suit. They want to put on the super suit and be like, it's time to be serious about this. <laughs> it's the Hugo Boss. It's the Hugo Boss effect. I call it the Hugo Boss effect. <laughs> <laughs> I love that explanation, man. I, I love it. And I saw. I hope it was. Yeah, yeah, I hope it was relevant. <laughs> it, it was good, man. I, I loved it. And, and I noticed that you you changed the buttons at, and you did a video about this as well because um, you like the silent buttons. So yeah. You mind the going reason... into that? No, yeah, yeah. We can absolutely go into that. Victrix wanted to know my opinion on the stick, and they know they know full well that I'm not like professional level, like Justin Wong level professional. Mm -hmm. Like I've I've got a YouTube channel, and I talk a lot about sticks, but I went into quite a lot of detail talking to him about like the acoustics of it because, in a way, thinking about what this is, since it is about the trimmings, it's about mm -hmm. the trimmings and knowing that you've got a stick that has the trimmings it may as well go all the way. And I was thinking acoustically, there are things that I would change, change about it. Not, I wouldn't change, it doesn't need to change so much that they need to like recall the product and make it again. But it's like the kind of review that if they were gonna make a Victrix Pro FS2 and then a Victrix mm -hmm. Pro FS2 Plus, which of course they absolutely clearly will, like every company, you'd be a fool, you'd be a fool to make a successful product and not make a, a successor to it. Yeah. I think. I think it would make sense to make it quieter. And also just because like yourself, you're a musician as well, right? So yeah. you know that like this means a lot to us to be well, just if you live in a house with other people, it's just they're just like, dude, it sounds like you're hammering on nails over there. It's like, I'm so sorry. Six are already quite annoying and this one is particularly loud with standard summer buttons. So I've been looking for something that would because I want I want this to be my main stick, but with the original summer buttons, it really was just really loud. And, I, and I've seen actually that a lot of people are fine with it. Now that, now that it's out there and people can test it out for themselves, they can stop nagging me and going, you don't know what you're talking about. So it's like, yeah, well, once you buy the stick, you can test it for yourself and you'll find out. And now they've tested it and they're like, oh, some of them like, some of them like the buttons, but personally it wasn't, it wasn't for me. So yeah, I've, I've gone for these Game of Finger buttons. And I've got another video coming up maybe tomorrow or the day after the mm -hmm. Sun Generation 2 silent buttons. I don't know if that answered the question at all. No, it did. It did. It did. <laughs> no, because I, I, I'm in the same boat uh, as you. Like, I, I'm not a professional player. So I was actually shocked when um, they were. And most to... people aren't, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like when they were like, hey, we'd like to work with you. Like, uh, what do you want for yours? We'll sing you a stick. And I'm like, hey, I'm just a guy in Hawaii. Like, I, I don't. <laughs> it, yeah. it threw me off. So. Yeah, I think they they understand. I'm not trying to say that they're the Jesus of fighting stick companies or something, but I think they have a good sense of reality and what what's actually happening. Street Fighter is a game. Street Fighter Five is a game that took a while to sell a million copies, and then eventually two million copies. But it took forever to get there, right? But that's two million people. Twitter, on the other hand, Twitter FGC is probably run by the same 35, 40 people. It's just those same tweets going around and around and around. Other people's opinions are joining the, the threads, but they're not getting read. It's like, it's just about those same 35, 40 people at the top. And I think the companies, 
hopefully in the future, are going to open up to the fact that the fighting game community is the two million other people who yeah. are also playing these games and buying these sticks. And of course, professionally, these are high top level players, so the opinions do count, but they're not everyone. So yeah. it makes sense to include the opinions of people like on the ground. I don't know if you would call them like the front line on the front lines. Just the common yeah. the common people to play the game. Yeah. So it's like this is this is clearly important because the people who are gonna keep this this company afloat are not the three the two or three hundred pro players that are out there, if there's even that many. Even if all three hundred of them buy Victrix Pro, it's not gonna keep their company afloat. It's gonna stay afloat by two million Street Fighter Five players. Who all think that they want one, right? Yeah, is what I think. Yeah, because I, I I've seen a lot of people, um, I, I've seen a lot of interest in the Vitrix Pro FS, mm. and a lot of people like, especially out here in our scene out here in Hawaii, they're like, Mikkel, have you tried it? Like, what what do you think about it? I'm like, I haven't. I've only heard about it, and just by hearing about it, my interest is there. I'm like, but I can't tell you if it's great or not. It looks good. Mm. Like I've not heard anything bad about it, but you know, compared to what I've used, like I've got the same fight sticks that you have. And it's like, the only thing I, I know is like, I'm going to get it, you know? And I told like, it was a shock to me when they said, we're going to send it to you. Cause I was like, I was going to buy it. When's it? <laughs> and they're like, Can I send you the money anyway? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I was talking to one of the guys at Vitrix and he was like, uh, cause I told him like, you know, is it, is it going to be in stock soon? Cause I know it sold out. Mm. He's like, um it should be pretty soon like cool because i'm gonna buy it he's like we're gonna send you one i was like oh (laughs) i'm glad to hear it (laughs) i'm glad i'm glad to hear it i think when people see the victrix i think the interest in the victrix pro fs isn't really in the stick i think the interest is in where are we going with this scene and if it's it's like i think victrix is more like showing a potential future for I don't want to use the word esports, but for fighting game esports. And yeah. people want to know, even if it is either it's going more esports or it's going more independent fighting FGC, whatever it is, people just want to know. They just want to know where is it going. And when we see new products come out, it mm-hmm. gives us more hope as to what to expect from our future. Like, or what is our future world going to look like? Which is why we're so desperate for updates about Street Fighter V. It's like, look, doesn't even really matter what it is. We just want to know what is our yeah. world because Street Fighter is my life. Please tell me what to expect from the rest of my life. It's the same with Star Wars as well. It's like when they go quiet about Star Wars and just movies come out and things are completely unexplained. It's like, why did that character die? Well, because you didn't think he was gonna die, and so now he's dead. It's like, what? That, but that can't be it. We need more. We need more. <laughs> Star Wars is my life. Tell me more. And I think fight, FS is more of a. I think FS is more of a. I don't know if the word is icon. The FS is more of a um, symbol. I think the FS is more of a symbol which represents where we think fighting teams are going in the future or something, or the scene well, is going. I, I agree with yeah. that. Because at the, at the end of the day, it's a Samo stick, it's Samo buttons. And if you're expecting it to, <laughs> to, to not, to feel like something different than that, then You've been, I feel like you missed the point. No, no, you, you're yeah. gonna pick it up. You're, you're gonna go from being the average player. It's gonna put you up there with Justin Wong just by having it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's not. Uh, and even then, and even then, what's what's been really nice about Fight Six up until this point is that the tools that these professionals have been using mm-hmm. are the same Atroxes and TE two pluses that you can buy at Target. So. Yeah. It's it's like nothing in that respect. Nothing is actually going to change. We're still going to we're still buying the same toys that the pros are using, and that's why arcade sticks feel a lot like guitars. Because when you go to the shop and you pick up a, an American Fender Standard, that's the exact same American Fender Standard that the pros have been playing. Yeah. It's not a special version. Of, of course, when they get really really famous, sometimes they get custom shop version. But even then, they'll make those custom shopper versions available for for normal normal regular customers to buy as well Definitely. that's something that's nice about these things unlike violin you get into violin you uh. pff, look it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how how good you are the likelihood that you're ever going to touch a stradivarius is there's like 30 on earth and there's like millions of people who want to play the violin 
it's not it's not it's just not this is just not this it's a, <laughs> completely, different it's a completely different world a great world but, but a different one true <laughs> as far as um future of street fighter 5 <laughs> when we go offline i will tell you about it because oh um, yeah we got the secret information i'm well i'm actually helping out with capcom next month interesting they're, they're doing something out here so i have to pick up uh some people and uh, so let's yeah. let's hope for the viewers sake let's hope that you accidentally don't press stop on the record button and it accidentally <laughs> information spreads and we you know stuff like that let's just say yeah this this I, i'll tell you offline <laughs> <laughs> sounds good but, sounds good but um yeah so the, the other question i had for you um let's see what have we not gone through i i feel like we we've run through so many topics um well if you're gonna edit if you're gonna edit it later then we can take as much time as, as you like because you can just cut out the gaps <laughs> <laughs> true um let's see I'm trying to think what else did I have? Uh, we went through all the different fight. Yeah, that sticks. Um, oh, um, with your fighting sticks, the, the various ones that you have, um, what are what are some of the things like that went into your purchasing decisions? Like if someone were new to sticks, like what advice would you give them from your own experience? This has to be the most common question ever asked. In the history yeah. of light sticks, is I'm a yeah. beginner. What what stick should I buy? And it's funny because I I generally don't give an an answer for it, because my because my channel is, is a lot like a, a an open a product demonstration channel because I do a lot of like product demonstrations. I always get this question: it's like which iPad should I buy? And then there's like no context as to who you are, how much money you have. It's just like which drawing tablet should I buy? Which guitar should I buy? Which arcade stick should I buy? But if I were a beginner, what I can tell you is that I bought the Hori Fighting Stick Mini 4. And I don't think it's a great stick now. I think for the money, it means that you've got a stick. And at the mm -hmm. start, for the first couple of weeks, it'll feel fine. But it will break eventually. The thing is, I, can't also, I also can't tell you that it's a bad start. Because I started with it. And now, mm -hmm. I've, now I've got tons of sticks. And so clearly it was a very successful, it might even be the most successful step towards getting into arcade sticks that I ever took. But because now that I own the other ones as well, I'd be like, look, if you want to get a stick, you're probably better off spending, it, it'll cost double, but probably getting like a Quamba drone. I really can't see any reason not to. I, I mean, I, I also, I have no contact with Quamba. I've never spoken to them once in my life, no <laughs> sponsorship at all, but I do own one and I think, Price-wise, I think your options as a beginner are Hori Fighting Stick Mini 4 for about $40, Juan Drone for about $80, and then there's quite a significant, oh no, and then for about $150, $140, you can get a Hayabusa, like a Hori stick. And then after that, you get the Panteras, Pantera Evos, and then obviously somewhere in the stratosphere, they don't even know what planet they're on, Victrix is up there with the, the Pro <laughs> I think you can't go wrong with, with pretty much any of them. What I would say is if you go with the cheapest one, the Hori Fighting Stick Mini 4, you're most likely going to end up buying a drone anyway. Yeah. You're going to like it, you're going to end up buying a drone, and then you'll have spent $120. And if you're going to spend $120, you may as well have just bought, <laughs> bought a, a, a Hori Hayabusa <laughs> to, to, to start with. The only problem is that if you really like Sanwa parts and you've played in arcades and stuff, you're going to have to... The Hori's, even the really nice ones, they don't come with Sanwa parts built in. You're going to have to a different stick in a different lever and a different and different buttons yourself so that's like an extra thirty dollars plus another probably twenty five dollars for the buttons so the money it just keeps there's always a way no matter what step you're at there's always a small micro step that leads to the next thing and mm -hmm. so just start anywhere <laughs> just start <laughs> anywhere have you used the um and it's kind of funny because i've only recently heard of this within the last week but the nacon daiju Daija, Daija. I think it's yeah. I think it's Chinese or maybe it's oh or maybe in Japanese. It's Chinese or Japanese. It's like it's either Daija or Daija, but in Japanese it's Daija, I think. It means like large snake or something. Mm -hmm. And the only reason okay, so when you're asked if the the original question, which was something like what what goes into your like purchase decision decisions yeah. when choosing sticks, I just don't have any need for the Daija in my life. 
the only time I've bought a stick was when I needed a stick. So most of the time, and I own, I own three of these, and I actually said it in the video. The reason I have three of these is because I kept ending up in places where I didn't have one. So I've got, mm -hmm. I've got multiple setups where I do these streams from. I've got this, I've got setup A and I've got setup B. And then I've also got a setup when I'm in the UK. It's just like, look, I need a stick that works on my PC and it may as well also work on a console. So it may as well be the Switch since the Switch is where I've got, what I've always got with me. So I kept buying this, this Hori Hayabusa, but you can see from the streams, I don't play that all the time. It's not like the stick that I always use. I always, I end up basically having spent probably pretty much all my streams have been always on, on this, the TE2 Plus. And the only thing is that it's, it's just such an awkward shape. It's blocky. You put it in your bag and literally nothing else will go in your bag except this now. <clears throat> and the Victrix, the Victrix is awesome because it's curved. And mm -hmm. so even, even though it's actually not that much smaller than the TE2 Plus, the, the shape just means that more stuff can go in your bag once the Victrix has gone in as well. <laughs> but yeah, so I bought the TE2 Plus because I wanted the customiza customizability, I wanted to be able to change the artwork. I bought the Hori Hibusas because I just kept, I just, did, I was always in a setup when I didn't have a stick. I think that's the same thing happened with the Pantera. I just didn't have a, a stick with sun with, with a sun lever and sun buttons, so I bought that one. <clears throat> the Victrix Pro, that was part of this, this video collaboration with Victrix Pro. There's always been some reason, but it's never just been like, I want sticks. Because sometimes people ask me, they're just like, when are you going to review the Quanbo Obsidian? I was like, I don't want that thing in my house. It's huge. <laughs> they're like, but you could add it to your collection. I was like, I don't collect sticks. I don't, I, I would much rather have only one. It's just that yeah. when you have multiple setups, you end up just having to have multiple sticks. <laughs> I don't have them because I like collecting. I don't like collecting. I like tools. I like using tools. Okay. But it's become a collection. I'm quite proud of it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for thumbnails. You can always take a picture of something. True. And uh, switching gears, <laughs> because this is something you do frequently in your videos, coffee. Let's talk about Oh, coffee. wow, yeah. <laughs> no, this, um, this is a whole new podcast. <laughs> Let's on the microphone. We'll, we'll make a new file. <laughs> Let's go. I'm ready. All right. <laughs> All right. Now it's okay. So that's becoming your coffee has become like one of the signatures of your your videos. So where did that come from? And <laughs> why? I know you love coffee, but you know, the people want to know. Where did the coffee come from? Um I well I was I've always really liked cafes, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I like cafes is that I, I basically have a massive weakness. I can't think if I sit still. It's like, you know, the, the, what we were talking about the one cheek piano player earlier. Yeah. Like I'm, on a, I'm, a, I'm a two leg thinker. I can't think when I'm not on two legs. <laughs> if I'm sitting down, the brain is off. Everything you've heard from this point. Oh, actually, I, I've been standing this whole time now. <laughs> I, I have to be in transit to think. And when I'm in transit, I can't use my laptop. And so the best place for me to work is to leave the house, go somewhere on foot, and then sit down at a cafe for like an hour, do some work, then stand up and go somewhere else again. So that's how I ended up getting really into cafes. And every time I would go to other towns, you could explore other cafes, right? So I was getting really into coffee for that reason, but I wasn't really into making coffee. And then I discovered with a friend this place where they were doing hand drip coffee. And there was mm -hmm. a, a little piece of paper. It was like, you could experience making coffee. I was like, <laughs> why would I? Why would I want to do that? I just want to drink the stuff and go to cafes. <laughs> like, if I if I make coffee at home, wouldn't that defeat the purpose? Now I'm not moving, and now I'm not thinking. So in, in a way, it was actually the opposite of what I wanted. But when did this like coffee dripping thing? And once you've done it, it's like. Oh, so you get it to the right temperature, you select the beans, you choose what roast you want, you grind them to the right level that you want, and then you put them in and you have to pour it at a certain speed. And then if you go faster, it tastes more bitter or sweeter, depending on all these things. Mm -hmm. And it's just like sticks. It's just like yo-yo, just like guitar. Once I find a rabbit hole to jump in, I'm like, let's go in the rabbit hole, let's go. <laughs> and it, that's, that's, that's honestly what it was. And you start, once you're deep enough into it, you start to realize how much it is like forming you mm -hmm. as, a, as a person. Just like, 
dedication to learning a musical instrument, it's not until you get to like grade eight, you're like, oh my God, my life is about practicing things and mastering them. It's like, I guess there's a, there's a mastery to coffee. I would say that I absolutely haven't mastered it and I don't practice it either, but I, I it became like, it, once it's set in your life, it starts to become this irremovable thing mm -hmm. that you were always going to find it eventually because it's clearly how your brain works. All these things that you keep touching and getting into, it's because your brain is just attracted to this, this sort of thing. And it's, it's the culture yeah. because it's ritualistic. Once you're doing it, then it's like, okay, now my brain is starting to move and it goes back to how I have to walk in order to think. And this is, this is the same thing. My hands in motion and this has all started. Once the process has begun, I'm, I've got momentum to like do things. Okay. And also, who loves, who doesn't love a bit of caffeine? <laughs> <laughs> have you got that cup? It says, do coffee. Do stupid things faster and with more energy. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, that's that's essentially all it is. I'm not doing anything better than before. It's just faster and with more energy. <laughs> just as dumb as before. Oh man. Favorite, favorite bug. That's my new job, by the way. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave video editing, I'm gonna leave video content, I'm gonna leave fighting games, I'm gonna go and make mugs. I'm gonna design those <laughs> all capital letters, little slogans that you see on mugs and those, you know when they sell photo frames and they've already got a quote inside them? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna design those quotes. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be so good, you're not even gonna to wanna to take it out and put your photo in. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, my well, career's okay. about to go downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I have to ask, when you were out here in Hawaii, um, did you oh, yeah. get to go to the the coffee? Because we have our own coffee. Lion. Lion, uh, Lion yes. Coffee. Did you get yes. to go there? Yes. So we rented a car in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and I drove, and I was like, well, we may as well go to Lion Coffee since it's, it's like right next to the airport or something. Yeah. I went there, and... Do you want my opinion of like how it tasted, or sure. or just my sure. what, what kind of opinion do you want about it? The raw and honest opinion. It's very American. <laughs> <laughs> it's very American. I'll just I'll just leave it there. No, I, listen. It was it was clearly it had a lot of character to it, mm -hmm. but it was so clear so clearly different to the coffee that I, I normally drink it's like there's a lot going on it's like <laughs> boom it's like it's like all these elements are like in the coffee it's like you drink it, it's like whoa this stuff is happening and i think what i'm i'm more used to mm -hmm. is going out and getting like a brazil or a guatemala or something and it's at a very medium roast and I cook it and it's it's like I feel like my goal is to make it as Guatemala as possible or make it mm -hmm. as Brazil as possible and I feel like the coffees in America or I, mean, I haven't tried them all or anything but I, like these coffees at Lion it's like it's like a roller coaster compared to a statue I guess I'm looking for this porcelain statue coffee <laughs> I'm like oh it's so smooth and it's the perfect shape and the proportions are like golden rectangle and everything and and other and other coffees are kind of like roller coaster rides of like it's a small world. No, Pirates of the Caribbean. It's one of those. It's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the other thing is the other thing is I have a really bad sense of smell, so I don't really taste things like anyone else does. Mm -hmm. Basically, I can't tell if there's coffee in the room. Sometimes I don't even know. Like my smell is actually that bad. So everything <laughs> that you hear in these videos when I'm tasting coffee is seeping in through my taste buds and then reaching different senses because the the smell sensor doesn't work like at all i have no idea i can tell i can tell if there's a like a if, yeah i can tell good smell and bad smell so if there's manure next door i'll be like whoa someone has got some manure outside <laughs> but if someone's if someone's got like chocolate in a bowl here and strawberries over here they'd be like Whoa, the chocolate smells really good. I was like, is there chocolate in the room? Like, I had no I don't even didn't even notice. Yeah, I think it's literally just broken. 
So yeah, my descriptions of coffee kind of make no sense. So I kind of apologize about that. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> Sorry, I don't, I don't know if that was the right answer. <laughs> I feel like that was very much the wrong answer. Did, did that make any sense at all? I think that was a more animated answer than what I was going to give. I was going to be like, yeah, Lion Coffee is kind of like a, it's a step up from Starbucks, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that, that type of coffee that's going to just like touch your soul. It's just, it's like Starbucks is here and Lion's like, mm, maybe a fresh, you know, yeah. it's good. But yeah, it's, it's, eh. In my opinion, in my opinion, I think people talk about coffees like there's Guatemalas and there's Brazils and there's Ethiopias, yeah. Lions, Starbucks, there's blends, all sorts of different roasts and stuff. And maybe it's just because I've got a broken nose receptor, mm -hmm. but I don't really see them as different types of coffee. I just see them as completely different drinks. Starbucks, <laughs> is just, <laughs> Starbucks just makes Starbucks drinks and Lion makes Lion drinks. I guess they're all cold coffee and they have the same caffeinated effect. Yeah, but uh, I, can't, I don't feel like they're varieties of coffee. They're just completely different drinks. <laughs> it's, it's really weird. I'm sorry. It makes no sense. I can't apologize <laughs> enough. You're going to have to delete this whole video because it makes no <laughs> sense. <laughs> sorry. Nihongo, that footage was completely unusable. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh. oh God. I don't even want to watch it back. It's going to make no sense. <laughs> I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna have to be the biggest troll on this video. I'm like, what is he talking about? <laughs> <sighs> oh man, um, it was one of the 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 last few. Qu yeah, I'm. Mm -hmm. It's it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. So I can see the fan moving in your room. So I thought my fan was on, but I don't. So actually, <laughs> I wasn't getting the effect. I had the. I thought I was getting cooler, but it's it's. Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh, man. sorry. Yeah, go on. What was the last one? No, uh, so uh, one of the, the last uh, two questions I want to ask <laughs> is um, what is the difference in um, I'm trying to formulate how should I ask this question? Uh, what is the difference in how the like because you're in Japan, so with consumers there, and you know, when it comes to like video games or whatever, how is it different than people in the West? Because I think when we talked about this a little bit before we went live, the type of entitlement, I guess you could say attitude, a lot of Western gamers and consumers have versus like, what is the alternative in the East? Like, is it different or is it similar or is it? I have to say that I'm, I'm probably not the expert. I don't really talk to enough other people about their opinions on mm -hmm. games. I can observe like buying habits and mm -hmm. the stuff that I see online. But something that I would say in general is that getting people's genuine opinions about things in Japan mm -hmm. just takes a few extra steps. And so it's not as clear. Whereas like Twitter in the West, it's like once something comes out, everyone's opinion about it is, is out there immediately. Yeah. But in Japan, even if someone does put their personal opinion about something out on the internet, It'll be under like a fake name or a fake icon so that no one actually knows exactly who they were. So mm. getting getting people's genuine opinions, it's a little bit more difficult. Mm. I I am I'm afraid I really don't I I don't really have a very good answer. Okay. I don't have a good answer, but hmm. I feel like the old stuff. People still pine for the old stuff. Okay. From, what, from the people I've spoken to, no matter what new stuff comes out, if you mention that a new Dragon Quest is coming out, people will remember the first Dragon Quest they ever played, and they'll expect to have as much fun as when they were a kid. Nostalgia is the king of everything in Japan. Okay. If you if you can tap into nostalgia, then it's like boom, you get the money. But it's going to be difficult. And people have asked me, they're like, I'm from this and this Western company, and we'd like to make a game and sell it in Japan. I'm like, well, can you tap into Japanese people's nostalgia? Because if you can't, you're going to have an uphill battle. You might make an amazing game, and people love... What was the Western game that came out that was, that was really big here? Uh, they were really excited about some of the like really big AAA titles. Mm -hmm. But... A lot of other games, like you see a lot of the Western indie games coming out on the Switch store. I'm like, I don't think any Japanese people are buying this. 
<laughs> if it's not something they remember from playing on the original Game Boy in the 80s, then it's like, like they're, they're playing games, not because they're gamers and gamer. Like, I feel like gamer still has more of a, a negative connotation in mm -hmm. Japan. And so if they're going to play games, it's not because they kept up playing games until they were 30 and they still want to play games. It's if it's gonna be if, if a thirty year old in Japan is gonna play a game, it's gonna be like for the nostalgia factor to remind them of what it was like when they were twelve and they played on the original Super Famicom. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that's kind of how it is. I mean, that could be completely wrong though. I really don't talk to enough people about their opinions about games in Japan, to be honest. Yeah, because I, I, I would know. say like culturally, like you, you can see the difference in how like the West, the Western preference for gaming, which is, you know, the sandbox, open world, oh, yeah. FPS style game, which I just don't feel like it's as popular in Japan or the East as it is in the West. Like, say, take Dragon Quest is a perfect example, which in the, you know, in the West, it wasn't really popular until, I guess you could say Dragon Quest Eight, which what was that, 2004? Mm. Yeah, that was popular, but Eleven is like now it's mainstream. But whereas in Japan, that's been a main that's been a mainstay title since. Yeah, I think you know, just I think Dragon Quest drums up way more nostalgia than than Final Fantasy does in yeah. Japan. When when PS4 came out, basically no one promised a Dragon Quest, and so the only thing people were excited about was Final Fantasy. And Final Fantasy wasn't going to release until another. Eight months until off, like after the PlayStation Four was released, it was a really weird PlayStation Four was such a weird release in Japan. Yeah, but with that about about the style of game, like genre of game, especially like first person shooters. I, I think actually a lot of young kids love first person shooters in Japan because mm -hmm. I used to teach English and I'd, I'd be like, "So what games do you play at home? Like, do you do you play like RPGs and this stuff like Call of Duty? I'm always on Call of Duty, and like a lot of them were learning English." By listening to people swearing through the headset, <laughs> oh, yeah, I was just like, "Whoa, wait!" I was like, "Yo, kid, don't say that out loud. That is that is the bad word." But they don't know that. All they know is just words happen on on the internet, and who knows who said them. So, about genre, I think the biggest one, like you mentioned, is the open world versus linear game style, and I would say that open world doesn't really drum up a whole lot of nostalgia. Whereas linear, it's a glorified story, basically, isn't it? And yeah. Japanese, I, I think in Japan, they've always loved stories, great yeah. stories being told. I want to hear a great legend about the great Luffy who went, to, went off into the ocean to become a pirate. That's exciting. It's just like, if you talk about Luffy, he's gone to find his mentor who's out there in the pirate world one day and he's going to find the treasure of One Piece. That's a story. But if you yeah. go, there's this new game where you can be a pirate on a ship and sail around to all of the islands, they'll be like, that sounds terrible. Why did I want to do that? I don't want to be a pirate. <laughs> I want to be Luffy. I want to be Luffy because that means yeah. something. He's got things that he's got things that are worth losing. He's got things that he wants. He's got risks that he can take, and he's got. A goal that he must absolutely achieve, otherwise he'll have it'll have all been for nothing. But to become great seafaring adventure on the wild west of mountains and gorons and whatever happened in Breath of the Wild. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really care that much for Breath of the Wild. <laughs> this is a massive cold take. Everyone's gonna hate this. But... <laughs> ten out of ten, ten out of ten, the greatest game of all time. It's like, well, it's the greatest game of all time if you like open world games, but that's basically what it is. It's Zelda characters in an open world game with elements of story-based Zelda games that came before it. But like, that's what Zelda 64 like opened up was a whole run around in an open field. It was crazy. It was amazing. But that's, it's hard to drum up nostalgia with an open world game, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I don't, I don't know for sure. I mean, I, because Breath of the Wild did do very well in Japan. So maybe Breath of the Wild was the start of Japan embracing the open world thing. And Japan loves Minecraft as well. Thanks to basically really? probably, well, because YouTubers played it. Oh, okay. Japan is easily swayed by YouTube. Easily, <laughs> easily, easily swayed. I have no audience, as far as I'm aware, I don't have very much of an audience in Japan at all. But Japanese YouTubers, if you play a game, all the kids are going to play that game the next day. They're just like, oh, so-and-so played it, I've got to play it too! 
so much power. Yeah. <laughs> that that, that kind of sounds like, uh, <laughs> and I'm breaking the fourth wall here, people. It's like me with having Hawaii's number one podcast, which I do. My audience is not in Hawaii. <laughs> Oh, like, like it, it's really funny. Um, we, you know, you break down the analytics of it, and my audience is usually the UK, the East Coast, and for some odd reason, a large part of Canada. <laughs> but Hawaii, no, they're like, oh yeah, 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 you're that guy with the podcast, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a linguistic confusion, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want to be the biggest podcast in Hawaii, or do you want to be the biggest podcast and you're in Hawaii? It's like, right. it's like what's, what's actually what what is the actual important aspect of this for you? I'm, I'm actually I'm actually quite interested to talk to you later about about the title of your podcast and and actually your, your channel in general. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, I guess the last question I have, um, because and I should have asked this at the beginning, but uh, are are you a entrepreneur? Because it seems like you you work for yourself. You know, you're very multifaceted. So, mm. I don't know how to describe it. I work for a company. I work okay. for a company. Um, but my expenses. I have to take care of a lot of the paperwork myself. That's okay. the easiest way to describe it. But essentially, I'm employed by a company to do video editing. Oh, okay, okay. This, all the YouTube stuff and all the stuff that I do on the side, that's just freelance, I guess you would call it. Okay. Okay. But cool. I don't, I, don't, I don't think yeah, I don't think it gets more complicated than that. Essentially, I'm I just I'm just I just work full time for for a company editing <laughs> videos, and then if I have time, I uh, stream and make videos. For would, myself. would you would you ever consider like YouTube full time? Not currently. Not currently. I think okay. when there was a YouTube gold rush four or five, three or four years ago, yeah, it might have been interesting to try jumping straight into YouTube full time. But it's so volatile. I think especially over the past few years, it's like it seems more and more volatile. And then you hear, I don't know if this is 100% true, but I don't think Google makes a lot of money from YouTube. I think basically they lose money by running YouTube. They make more money if they just got rid of it entirely. Yeah. They don't make any profit. But of course, by having the platform, they can promote all of their, all of their other stuff. They can sell people's personal data because that's essentially what Google's business is, right? Taking yeah. people's personal data and selling it to companies, and YouTube's people's watching habits—that's that's all the information. That's a gold mine of information. Yeah. So the platform itself doesn't make them a lot of money, but having YouTube is really important, clearly, to Google. It's just if it's not that profitable, then it could just disappear. And are you are you would you be happy to have your company, <laughs> your entire platform that you've based your company on, disappear overnight? I, I feel like. <laughs> that would be kind of that would be kind of scary. Maybe not right now, but you know, YouTube's been around for like over a decade now, right? It's been out yeah. for ages, so seems like it'll probably be around for a little while longer. So hopefully. Good. All right, and I lied. I have one final question for you. <laughs> go on, go for it, go for it. Did you have fun? Uh, when I did what? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have fun? <laughs> oh, with this with this podcast? Yes. Yeah, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. It's an interesting. It's an interesting style to to. It's it, because there are. Is it a podcast? Is it an interview? Is it a conversation? Is it this new thing? Is it? It's 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 its own thing. So it's it's quite interesting to see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course, I had fun. Yeah. I, I hope it, I hope it came through. Wait, was it? Did I look like I was having so little fun that you needed to confirm? No, Wait a no. minute, did you, you, you had fun. You know, you know what it's like at the end of it. <laughs> you know, sometimes on the first date, at the end, you're like, so you had a good time, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like, you managed to get through four hours of this date and we still, you still don't even really know if the other person's having a good time that you got to ask. <laughs> it's happened, come on, you know, you know what it's like. <laughs> I do, I do, I, I, I've, I've done, I'm like, oh, this was so fun, wasn't it? Yeah. You, had, you had fun, right? <laughs> I, 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 you, you did, yeah, because I had fun too, yeah. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> oh 
Oh, man. Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, where, where can people find you? They can find me at youtube.com stroke Nihongo Gamer. And Twitch, I think it's twitch.tv stroke Nihongo Gamer. I'm on Twitch. I think I'm going to be less, sorry, on Twitter. I think I'm going to be less active on Twitter in the future. But yeah, Nihongo Gamer on YouTube and Twitch and Twitter. Okay. And Thank you very much. I will leave links to all that down in the description below. And uh, you'll be able to catch this episode of the Castle Podcast on. Let me take a breath because this is going to be a mouthful. Okay, three, two, one, go on iTunes, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, coming soon to iHeartRadio, also coming soon to Podcast One, and very soon, whenever they finalize the paperwork, Sirius FM Radio. And you can find it on YouTube here at uh, what? YouTube.com slash Mikhail Casanova. I forgot. I don't know why. Anyway. <laughs> You know, you that's like that's like monkey wrench. Do you do you know do you know Foo Fighters monkey wrench? Yeah. <laughs> and he does it all in one breath. He's like, oh, one last thing before I I'm never want it anymore. <laughs> and you can only do the final scream of that song if you've genuinely done it all in one breath. Otherwise it wouldn't sound <laughs> genuine. Like, that's your that's your monkey wrench. Right? <laughs> it's good. Uh, I like it. Uh, oh man. <laughs> All right, and uh, Nihongo Gamers, stick around. Um, we're going to go ahead. I'm uh, in the podcast soon. And, uh, yeah, with that being said, people, make sure you go and subscribe to Nihongo Gamers' channel. As and well subscribe as to Mikkel. Hey, you know, if you want to, <laughs> if you guys want to, you can definitely do that, too. Make sure you follow him on Twitter and on Twitch. Make sure you follow his Twitch streams. Amazing content that this man makes. I'm a big fan. Been a fan for years. And yeah, with that being said, thank you guys for watching. We'll catch you in part two at some point down the road. <laughs> Goodbye. Did you enjoy this episode of the Casanova Podcast? Well, I hope you did. And if you did, please make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. And let us know what we can improve upon, what you liked, what you didn't like, and all that good stuff. And just make sure you always have a good time. That being said, this is your boy Mikael Castanova, my wife's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out, and I'll catch you on the next episode.